Hi everyone, uh, I'm Vishal Bhartia and uh, I run a company called Cloud Cover. Um, that's me. Um, so I actually we have two companies. Um, Act Development is a software development company. We've been building stuff for a while now. Um, I started Act Development in 2002. So we've been around for 12 years now. And Cloud Cover is a new thing that I've started which is it deals with uh, cloud consultancy. Um, we're cloud agnostic, so we help companies achieve scale on all the various cloud offerings. Uh, could I have a quick show of hands? How many folks are working like exclusively with cloud hardware right now? And is anybody here that doesn't work on any cloud stuff? Sure. As loud as you like. <laughs> Anyone who's not working on any cloud stuff? What's wrong with you guys? Come on, get onto the cloud. Alright, so I'm going to jump straight in here and I'm going to actually back it up and, uh, and come into each of the individual elements as to why we chose to do the things we did uh, and specifically talk about the problems that we had. But before we get to that, let me just tell you what this product is. Um, so this is a customer of ours uh, and I'm kind of their acting CTO right now because they don't have anybody that fits the bill. Um, They've been our customer now for five years, so we've kind of scaled with them and we've brought them to the point where they're capable of doing the work that they do. Uh, PySmart is an electronic prepaid recharge system, right? So what that means is that they do top-ups for your Dish TV, your Tata Sky, um, your Airtels, and also all the mobile carriers. So they also do it for like Vodafone and Tata Docomo and <coughs> they basically serve everybody, right? So any of the... Uh, the major satellite operators, any of the major telephone operators in India, um, they offer those services. So this is a B2B model, right? It, it's They have literally like 50,000 different retailers all over India. Um, they have, what, 2,500 distributors and they're literally in every single town. And the way that it works is you send an SMS uh, to BuySmart send an SMS or you use the Android application or you use the website and all that stuff ends up at BuySmart and then we talk to each of the different uh, operators that are there. right? Um, and we have to do this, so there's separate integrations with every single one of the carriers and every single one of the carriers has a different API and every single one of them is using a, a different backend and it's effectively it's a nightmare. Right? It's like every single one of them is horrible. Um, so things that you have to keep in mind as to the complexity of the system or the reasons why it was hard for us to scale, there's lots of concurrent connections. Um, a typical top-up would take at least three separate HTTPS connections in which we are polling some service and we are waiting for a response. And in some cases, the SMS is coming in from an external aggregator. Uh, in some cases, obviously, it's coming in directly from the website or from an Android application, in which case it's a little bit easier for us to handle. Um, but when we started out, all this stuff was synchronous and obviously one of the learnings that we had was let's switch everything to being as async as possible um, and I'll get into you know some of the ways that we achieved that. Um, some of the vendors were absolutely horrible, like some of them took 60 seconds to respond. I'm not naming any names but there are certain uh, TV companies down south that their systems are absolutely horrible. I don't even know how they managed to get this far. Um, goes down every day, you know, there's... Uh, and, and the thing is that when, when we first built the system, we kind of had multiple services sitting on the same instances and like you could have cases where one vendor goes down and takes down half your system. So it was absolutely horrible. But we, we've grown past that actually. Okay, so I, I really hate cricket and I really hate cricket because, not because of the sport, the sport, you know, we had Azaruddin and stuff and that kind of, like, you know, spoiled me on the topic. But, but not counting them, as far as BuySmart is concerned, we have massive traffic spikes every time that there's an IPL starting up or if there's a Champions League starting up or India, Pakistan, God forbid. Um, number of transactions that we see on a daily basis can double or quadruple on what I consider a bad day, what sales considers a good day. Um, month end closing is always bad and the absolute worst is the time we're entering right now which is your year end closing where everyone is trying to close their books at the same time. And since this is a transaction and a B2B system, um, obviously 
there's finance involved, and obviously you're going to have lots of reports that need to be generated around this time of the, uh, of the year. So these are the, the, the difficulties that we face, and all of that led to massive amounts of failure. Okay, we screwed up big time. We were down for you know at one point in time we couldn't even turn on the instances. There was so much traffic coming to it. Uh, we couldn't get to them. How many times have you like you know had an instance that you can't even SSH into because it's just absolutely getting destroyed by your application, right? Uh, we face them. So why exactly did it start failing, right? Um, as a totally straightforward thing, when I say fail, I mean the application crashed or the service timed out. And basically, what it amounts to is that you can't respond to the user in time. You know, the dreaded 500 server error, right? Um, when that starts happening, you have to kind of look a little bit further to figure out why, right? And these are, you know, the typical reasons why something like this could happen. Because you're constrained at a resource level, right? You have only a certain finite amount of compute, you have a finite amount of memory, you have a finite amount of storage, database, and network bandwidth. And these things in conjunction cause issues. In most cases, it's just because they're not fast enough, right? They can't deal with the, with the traffic that you're putting on it. It might be because your application is not you know, optimized enough to get it done uh, or as is also the possibly the case, you just haven't budgeted for that much uh, traffic. Um, given that fact and given the fact that we've looked at these problems from various different angles, now we've been doing this not just for BuySmart but also for other companies that have similar problems of scale and you know 95% of the time the problem always comes down to the database. It's almost like the guaranteed failure point because they haven't got the appropriate level of caching or their queries are too slow or they're using too many inner joins. There's a lot of like you know issues in terms of the way the, the application itself is built that there's very little that you can do at a DevOps level to kind of fix. You have to actually fix the code. Um, so that basically comes down to again disk and compute and memory and, and it's various different aspects of how much and how little you should have in order to have a, a you know a system that is reliable. So the first solution that everyone obviously comes up with is let's just throw money at the problem, right? What does that mean? That means let's add more instances, let's increase the size of the instances, let's just basically throw more money at the problem and hope to God that it doesn't fail, right? This obviously is very very expensive. We have. I mean, at one point in time, we were spending upwards of $25,000 on our servers just to keep the application up and running. And that, to give you an idea of how far away we were from where we should have been, today, with even more capacity, we're running at a run rate of about $6,000 a month for Bicemart. So that was the saving that we achieved through just, you know, fixing the problems behind the scenes. Um, this is only useful as a band-aid, it is not sustainable. At some point in time, your CEO is going to come knocking and say, fix the problem because I cannot afford to run this business if you're charging me so much for just the server hardware. So there's a very real business problem that's underlying this, right? This is not just a case of, hey, it's a technical issue. This is actually going to matter in terms of profitability at some point in time. So second solution, unfortunately, is to fix the problem. I can't think of anything else that you can do short term besides just throw money at the problem. But that will buy you enough time to hopefully start fixing these things. And there's a lot of stuff to fix. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to actually take you through the steps that we did. Now we didn't necessarily do them in this order, but I have organized them in um, firstly the most logical order I could think of and secondly hopefully the order in which it is um, easiest to start. So you start gaining results right away. And the first thing that we started doing was we started caching static content. This seems like an absolute, like you know, no-brainer. Uh, I'm sure that you know a lot of you are already doing it. If you aren't, you really should because this is something that costs you very, very little. In fact, it's probably going to drop your costs. Um, it is very, very easy to achieve, and um, it genuinely reduces the amount of work that your web server has to do. The reason for that is. So a content distribution network is basically a, a place where you can upload static content and it gets served from edge locations all over the world. Right? You've got multiple options in terms of which cloud to use or which provider to use. I've just listed four of them. The Wikipedia page literally has like 50 of them. 
So you don't have any kind of like concerns in terms of uh, finding one that fits your bill uh, and, and, and you know uh, achieves what you're looking for. You don't need a web server for a lot of this stuff. CSS files, JavaScript files, images, um, God forbid, flash files. Um, all these things are static content. Once you've built them, you've saved them, they're not changing. There's no execution that's occurring at the server. So these are very, very good candidates to just push onto a content distribution network, change the link that you're using to access that resource, and boom, you've got, you know, 20, 30, 40 less requests going to your web server every single time somebody loads a page. Like, how many of you guys are using web applications? How many of you are like, administering web applications? Right? Every single one of your problem. At that point in time, look at your web page and tell me how many of them have CSS files, how many of them have JavaScript files, how many of them have image files. Every single one of those shouldn't be going to the web server anymore. Shouldn't be asking the question of your web server. Number two, managed services. So if you're in the cloud and you're running your own database server on a standard, box standard instance, my recommendation is get the hell off it because there are managed services available from pretty much every single one of the cloud providers and a whole bunch of other people besides, people like Engine Yard, people like Heroku are offering you specific servers that take care of your database workload. They are very, very good at administering them. They are very, very good at monitoring them. They are very, very good at scaling them. Don't try and reinvent the wheel. Use stuff that other people have built that are already operating at scale. So in our particular case, we were using MySQL. We used Amazon's uh, RDS, which is their relational database service. And we used that for being able to create lead slaves. We used that to create replication of replicas. So basically, you can create a copy and then create a copy of that. Fantastic for reporting because you don't need to have that data coming from your live server. And it takes care of creating the instances easily and effectively at a like, you know, click of a button or a script execution. So it gave us the freedom to concentrate on other stuff. So uh, the relational database system that's provided by service, sorry, that's provided by Amazon, um, that's what we use. We use MySQL on that. Um, it's basically a managed service specifically for databases. So you have the option of using MySQL, Postgres, uh, yeah. Oracle, and SQL Server. And you can choose the instance, the, 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 um, the type that you want, and then just basically fire up an instance, and it's fully configured and ready to go. So they give you an IP address, and they give you the username and password for the admin user. Log in directly from your application, start consuming the database. You can change the size whenever you feel like it. You can change the size of the instance itself, that is at least the compute and the memory. Or you can change the size of the hard drive dynamically. It takes backups every five minutes automatically. And those backups are kept for a duration of time, so you can use them as point of time restores. And if, for God forbid, something horrible happens to your instance, you can get another one in about 10 minutes. So in terms of downtime, it's insane because you get it back with the last backups data. Right, so you can basically say, okay, this is my master server. I need to have a read slave that I can start using for just read queries. Basically, right click, create, read save, wait 10 minutes, that is up. Right, so you you take away that problem of, oh my god, I have to worry about backing up my database, I have, how do I transfer the data, how do I, you know, these problems that kind of just, they bog us down and really we have no business doing these things because there are other people that have already solved this problem. Why are we reinventing the wheel? Right, so we've used RDS exclusively for all our database stuff. I can't say enough good things about it. There are equivalent services from all the other major clouds and from a lot of other smaller players as well. You want MongoDB? That's available on Rackspace. Just go over there, start up an instance and you're ready to go. Um, you know, you, you want uh, SQL Server, it's available on Azure. So you've got so many different options these days. You really need to like, you know, go do your research, find a managed service for your database, migrate your data over there and you will see benefits in terms of the amount of time it takes you to administer and the amount of flexibility that you have. And these resources become fungible because any time you need another one, you can just like right click create another one. You know, it's, it's not like that huge headache of how do I migrate my database. It kind of takes away the problem of that. How much they are charging for it? Uh, it's typically the same as what you would pay for a normal instance. Okay? Only catch. 
What's that? Okay, so let me give you the most expensive one they've got. Uh, if you're running Oracle, okay, uh, on RDS in a large server, it's about 54 cents an hour. Okay, and that's like with the Oracle license fee baked in. So you don't have to buy the Oracle license, it's actually charging you for it per hour. Which means that when you stop it, you no longer have to pay Oracle, which is also very good. Right. So the next point was add elasticity. This looks super simple. This is the hardest slide. Okay, doing this is the hardest, hardest part because you have to make sure that your application, whatever the point at which you want to start scaling it out, you have to make sure that that application is actually capable of running in parallel. And that means that things like sessions need to be stored outside the web server. Things like your database needs to be common because you're basically copying a web server once, twice, thrice four times in order to deal with scale horizontally and then you're load balancing. So you're taking every single request that comes in and you're saying, okay, I want you to go to server one, I want you to go to server two, server three, server four. And it has to be smart enough to do that and not screw up the user experience. Which means that your application has to be clever enough to deal with the fact that I'm not going back to the same server every time. When I hit F5, I'm not going back to the same server. I might go to a different server. And that server has to be just as capable of answering that user's request as the first one. So this took time for us to figure out. Luckily, we were using you know external session state management. We already had a common database. So this part for us was not killer, but I've had enough problems dealing with customers of ours where they don't have this stuff sorted out to begin with. And that's a huge, huge hassle. Hopefully, your, your application and the, the operation that you've already got going has some of this stuff sorted out, but this is a killer. If you don't have this, this is like step one to being able to scale. And again, you know, auto-scaling is something that... So let me touch upon auto-scaling really quick. Auto-scaling is this concept which is very cloud-specific because it requires a certain amount of virtualization for it to work effectively. What it means is, you set an arbitrary parameter, whatever you think is right. So this is actually figuring out what that parameter is is also very difficult. You have to choose based on your application, what is the point at which this server cannot serve one more guy. Like if somebody else was to come and ask this server for information, it would fall down, it would die. At that point in time, well hopefully not at that point, maybe at 75% of that, you want to have another server startup automatically that will deal with that next request that comes in. And more important than that is to remember that when that requirement goes down again, that server needs to shut off as well. Because again, it comes back to price, right? So right now we have three separate auto scaling groups at Bysmart, all of which are dealing with different aspects of the application that I showed you. And I'll, I'll give you a network diagram of how we built it at the very end. Um, so the, you basically figure out, okay, at this point in time, I'm serving, let's say, 50 requests a second on this box. If I put one more request on there, it's going to start dying. I need another server up right now. And you build that script, you figure out how to measure the point at which you want to do that, you figure out how you want to scale it, and the cloud offers you APIs that let you scale, and then the new instance that starts up gets added to the load balancer, and it just starts handling requests. And the second that it's done, you remove it from the load balancer and drop the instance. Does that make sense? Yeah? Cool. Alright, number four, cache. This is hard. Not as hard as the other one if you haven't done it. But it's still hard. Sure, go ahead. Okay, before disconnecting, like how you configure that one? Like, I have like 50 requests, okay? If I get another one, 50 one will die. So, how you like, how you calculate it and cut it? And like, I want to be, the server needs 48 requests, then you will cut it down, you will go to the cache. How do you calculate it? Well, so when I say that it's in server 50 requests, today we have a mechanism which tells me how many concurrent requests the server is running. And I'll get into how we got to that point where we can actually figure that out. It's not something that is available to you as a metric, right? It's not something that you can just say, hey, you know, this is the parameter that I want to use. Now when this parameter gets hit, scale the instance. Usually scaling is done on things like uh, CPU utilization, RAM utilization, how many uh, concurrent requests are there. Uh, these are the things that you can kind of sort of get from your application or from your VM layer. And those are fine and maybe those will work for you. We have had a bad time doing it on CPU because our application, and our, if you remember at the, at the beginning I mentioned the fact that a lot of the vendors take a long time to respond. 
right? So if I'm communicating with, say, for example, say Dishni, and Dishni he has a problem, and it's taking like two minutes to respond back to me. But you know what happens there is now I have, you know, a thousand threads, all of them eating up RAM, all of them just sitting over there waiting for a response from Dishni. Well, that takes up no CPU time. But my RAM is there, like I'm done, there's no space left, right? And the next one that comes is a server file number, right? You have to fit your scaling requirements based on what you feel are the appropriate parameters. So now for that particular box, what we're looking at is how long is this TV taking to respond? For us, that is the most important parameter. So we're using that to define whether you should scale off. Right? So you have to figure out what metric to use or co combination of metrics to use in order to achieve auto scale correctness. It's not straightforward. And anyone who says it's straightforward hasn't done it in practice. When you're actually doing it, you realize that you can't just say, hey, if CPU hits you know 90%, then scale. But then it's already too late. <coughs> the applications already failed to hit 90%. Right? So finding those parameters is not easy. But getting them right is like once you once you've done that, you kind of fixed the core underlying problem. Right? So you fix the fundamental issue and that makes the rest of it much, much easier to deal with. Um, we use this uh, we use this metric now which is uh, cost per unit of work and unit of work is whatever you define so like let's say in our case a unit of work for buy smart is one complete transaction right so to, to go and get an sms to deal with the financial implications of that within our system to forward it to the vendor to get the response from the vendor and send the response back to our retailer like that entire leg is one unit of work what is that cost in terms of hardware? What is that cost in terms of software? What is that cost in terms of computing power, raw computing power? And then of course, it's dollars. Figuring that out was the most useful thing we did. Because once we had that number, when that number went down, we knew we had done a good thing. When that number went up, we knew we had done a bad thing. So we introduced a feature to the web application that drove that number up by 20%. A feature, right? <laughs> It ended up being a bug because it was screwing up. Like it was a new, it was a new uh, graph on the dashboard, right? And every single person that was logging in was hitting that graph, and every single one that was doing that was causing our, our CPU to slightly, slightly spike high. And you know, when you amalgamated it over the course of time, that thing cost us twenty percent, which was insane. I mean, for a small feature like that, which nobody really asked for, it was just one of those things developers thought would be cool, right? So they put it on the dashboard, started screwing up. He forced them to optimize it, moved it to cash, and then it started working okay. Right? So cash is like magic. Okay? If you do it right, cash ends up being like magic. Because all those queries that were taking forever to execute, suddenly, magically, they come back in milliseconds. Right? Because what's happened is you've taken something that used to use a spinning disk to get the answer. Right? And you've moved it into RAM. And when it's in RAM, access to that is almost instant. I was having a conversation at JS School in Bangalore last year with um, one of the guys who was building uh, Book My Show, right? And they hit a hard wall in terms of their scale as well. And what they did was they just moved everything into Redis. They moved their, like the vast majority of their queries just moved into Redis. And suddenly, magically, Book My Show doesn't fall out anymore, right? Because they've taken care of the bottleneck. The bottleneck, like I said in the beginning, almost all cases ends up being the spinning disk behind the database because that thing is slow it's always been slow it's going to stay slow until we start using ssd back storage and even then it's still going to be slower than ram no matter what you do so it always makes sense when it when it is possible this is expensive right because you're putting all your data into ram and ram is not cheap and ram is volatile and if that server dies you've lost that data but if you can figure out what to put into RAM, right, it can make the difference between life and death as far as your application is concerned. Figuring out what to put in RAM is another trick, right? It's like we looked at the top 50 queries that were taking too long. And what we realized was in all those queries, the thing that was taking too long was the fact that we had to check whether this user was allowed to buy this product 
And that requirement to check if the guy was allowed to buy the product required us to go to the database, pull out all the products that he had access to and figure out whether in that product list, this particular product is allowed to be bought. Right? Then we do another query to find out whether this guy had enough balance to be able to do the purchase. Right? Then we have another query to check if he was blocked in the system. Right? First thing that we did was we combined all these queries into a single query. That improved performance a little bit. But it was still a spinning disk at the end of the day. And all that happened was instead of firing three separate queries, we were firing one query with lots of joins. So it didn't really give us that performance boost that we were hoping for. What we ended up doing was we moved that entire that data set of whether that user was allowed to access that particular resource into the cache. Now I have an object for every single user in my system. When the question gets asked, do I am I allowed to buy this? The response comes back in like you know, sub MS numbers. So and the database just stopped heating up. Magically just stopped heating up. So we're still using the RDBMS at the back to store that data. If we ever change that data, we still write it back to the DB. But rather than every single transaction requesting that data from the DB, we request it once when the data changes. And that's it. Then it's stored in that. Right? So by using SQL as your canonical store, you're basically taking away the problem of the volatility of RAM. Because you're never changing the RAM value. You're always changing it on the disk and then updating the RAM. Right? What that forces is that because that data is already on the disk, if this server was to die, I haven't lost anything because all the data is still in the database. Right? Loose coupling. Loose coupling is this concept where rather than um, having your application call things in sequence and rather than having all these parts live inside a monolithic application, you split up pieces based on units of work. Right? So in our case, we split it up into this is the SMS piece. It deals with getting all the SMSs from the aggregators. Then we had another piece in the middle that dealt with the transaction itself. That is cutting the money from the guy's back basket, making sure that he has the appropriate uh, funds in the basket. All that stuff is the transaction engine. That's like the core of the system. And then we had another piece which was the, uh, the aspect that actually has to talk to all the external services. So the one that's talking to VideoCon, the one that's talking to Dish TV, the one that's talking to Tata Sky, all of those are now separate services. So we broke the application, exploded it into as many pieces as we could think of, made them into small, 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 small little modules. And now you've got all these little modules, you want them to talk to each other, right? How do you make them talk to each other? So we use queues and we use publication and subscription. So how many of you all know what PubSub is? Okay, um, super simple, really quick. All it is, is let's say that this is a publication, okay, and any number of applications can subscribe. Okay, so let's say that for in our case, you receive an SMS, right? You say, okay, publish the fact that we've received an SMS, okay, and I have one subscriber whose job it is to write that SMS to the DB. I have one subscriber whose job it is to write that SMS to the cache. I have one subscriber whose job it is to write that to a log. Right? One to write to a queue. Tomorrow, if my CEO says, hey listen, when we get an SMS, I need to be able to uh, send a notification out to this particular other service. Well, that's really easy now because that just becomes one more subscriber. Right? So that changes the way you start thinking about architecting the application and it also gives you this amazing flexibility to deal with problems that they find, that your, that your business keeps throwing at you, right? If you can split up all the various activities of your application into individual publications, just like thousands of publications. Now, we've actually built a tool where this thing sits over there and it subscribes to everything, right? And I have a log, like a console log that shows me in real time every single thing that is happening on all my servers. Right? Because they are all subscriptions, they are all publications. I get those notifications on my browser window and it just keeps scrolling like crazy. We get, you know, because we got so many different transactions that are happening. The value of that, the value of having that really fast scrolling list is when errors start occurring, you will start seeing rows get marked in red. 
as the errors are occurring. So if you see like a sea of errors suddenly start coming, you know something is up. One of your servers is misbehaving. Right? So we use that automatic obviously. Now we have stuff that subscribes to these things and deals with the errors individually. But seeing that visually made a huge difference for us initially. So in yes, publication subscription. Queuing, I think all of you all should know what it is. Basically, you keep building a queue, you start pulling out items from it. It's a way of using many, many small services to deal with the same data set. So let's say that in our case, um, every single one of these transactions has to be dealt with. Every single one of these transactions, whether it's come from the Android, whether it's come from web, whether it's come from SMS, I have to process that transaction. So I put it in a queue and the appropriate services pick up those transactions, deal with them and put them back into another queue. And that queue is then processed to deal with whether you have to send a notification over the web or whether you need to send an SMS out. All those things are handled from there. So we have split everything up into publications and into queues. The value of that is it allowed us to it allowed us to rebuild our auto scale. Because now all of a sudden we had all these small, 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 small parts. Right? So you took an application that used to live on one massive server that was able to auto scale. But I was auto scaling this huge server every time. So when I ran out of space, when I hit that threshold and I had to scale, I had to scale another huge instance. Now, when I hit a threshold, I'm hitting a threshold for just the Tata Sky service, or I'm hitting a threshold just for the SunDirect service. And only the SunDirect server starts scaling, which is a small little instance. So again, my costs went down because I had all these little, little pieces that I had to scale rather than this one big application. I'm going to go back here. So, consider no SQL. It's not some magic bullet that if you shoot it at your application, it's going to solve the problem. But it does help in specific instances. It makes a huge difference in terms of, like for instance, for us, when we started using um, DynamoDB, well, we, we've been using SimpleDB for a very long time, and now we started switching to DynamoDB because SimpleDB is done. It took load away from our database and it gave us the flexibility to be able to just keep adding more and more rows without having to worry about the schema. We didn't have to think about, oh, this particular uh, vendor of ours is returning some completely different type of data from this other vendor. I was able to take all that data, irrespective of whether those fields matched, and put them into separate DB. It allowed me to basically worry about the problem later. And that allowed us to scale without killing our developers. And that's, a, that's important as well. We used MongoDB in the past. We used a lot of Redis, which is not on this list, but is also very, very useful as a key value store. I encourage you to look for the right tool for your job. Each of these things does something totally different. Each of these things makes a different trade-off in terms of capacity, availability, or partition problems. And you have to choose which one you want. You have to choose which ones you care about and deal with them accordingly. Uh, it's not an easy choice and it does take a lot of effort in terms of figuring out the right stuff, but it is valuable and it does actually give you benefit in terms of scale. Once you've done all this stuff, you have to optimize for cost. You've got to fix the problems in terms of reserving capacity. So this is the case for most cloud services, but it also makes sense for specific instances that you've got running. Even local stuff, if you've got hardware that you've bought in like a data center, you have to choose how much of that you need, right? So resource planning is super, super important. In our case, we had to choose what to reserve, how much to reserve, because at peak load on, on a Sunday uh, evening of an India-Pakistan match, I might see, you know, 600, 700 transactions a second. At that point in time, it's too late. Like, I have to scale, right? But I can't afford to reserve all those instances because I use them only once a year or I use them twice a year. So you only reserve the stuff that you know is your baseline. That's what you have to use every single day, no matter what, come rain or shine. This is an iterative process. You reserve only when you show, and then you choose later on when you see that this, this particular thing is getting used a lot. Again, if you size your instances correctly, it allows you to size in, uh, scale in smaller increments. So you use very, very tiny servers that are capable of doing just that job, and they have many, many of them. Because you have no limitations in terms of how many in the cloud, right? You can just go nuts. You can have hundreds of servers running, nobody cares. But each of those servers has to be sized right. Otherwise, you're paying too much for that, that particular computer capacity. So let's talk about BuySmart today after we did all this crap. 
That's how many stores we address. All over India. Some of them are like, you know, off in the islands over there. And that is the footprint of the number of retail locations that we've got. This is our architecture. It's highly simplified for this slide. Uh, there's many other moving parts and there's stuff that obviously you can't see like you know our, uh, our development environment, our staging environment, all that stuff is not in here. But in a nut, this is what we've done. So we use, firstly this entire thing is running on Amazon. Um, we use Route 53 for DNS resolution, which is their DNS service. Um, that's for bysmart.co.in. All our users come through there. We've got load balancers for SMS, we've got load balancers for the web. And the Android application is now consuming the web API as well. So basically, we had used to have another line over here for Android. Now both those lines have ended up being the web server. Um, so this thing passes SMSs that come in from our aggregators. Our aggregators send us what's effectively an HTTP post. We pass that HTTP post, speed it up into all the pieces. So it's like the syntax is um, top up dot password dot product name dot amount dot phone number or dot subscriber name. So we have to split that up into all the parts, that's what the SMS servers do and then funnel them into the queue and the simple DB. We are changing this to Dynamo DB because it uses SSD that storage it's a lot faster and more reliable. That's, that's what we're doing right now, that's part of our development process right now. Um, so SQS is the queuing system. What we do is we put the data in here and we add an element to the queue over here. And then these are all the services that we're using for all the third party vendors. And this thing scales horizontally. Each of these services is separate. So there's one service set for VideoCon, there's one service set for uh, Data Sky, and so on and so forth. What that allows, so firstly, that's not just one auto scale group, it's actually 32 separate auto scale groups for this piece. Right? And that scales horizontally as well. So as you can see, by loosely coupling all the services, and that's, that's our relational database system, so we use RDS over here. We have one master server, we actually have it shown all of them, we've got at this point six separate read scales. All of them doing various different activities. And then some of them are small, some of them are large, depending upon the workload that's there. Any questions about this while I'm on the slide? Sir, simple DB is no SQL DB, right? Yes. And there is RDS, relational database. So we are using both of them. We have to use both. We have to use both because our transaction engine needs consistency because we're dealing with money, right? So I have to cut the money, I have to make sure the money is cut, and then I can pass it on. What we're using simple DB and SQS for is to deal with these services, right? So every time there is a transaction, Every time there is a pop up that has to happen, once I've figured out from RDS that you have enough money, that you're allowed to access it, that all that stuff's taken care of, then I write an item to the queue and I write the item to the simple DB. And then these services pick up the item from the queue, say, okay, this is the key that I need, grab the key from simple DB, process the entire transaction, and write it back to the queue. It's actually a different queue that it goes back to. Like I said, this is super simplified. But it goes to a different queue, which is the back inbound queue, and writes to a different simple DB with the data that came back from the vendor and then that gets processed once again by our SMS or our web server Right? But your SMS users does not come through route 53 DNS No, basically these guys, well they still use Bysmart, not, it's not bysmart.co.in, it's a subdomain.bysmart.co.in So we still use route 53 for DNS but um, those URLs are basically uh, set inside our aggregators so our aggregators have a specific endpoint that's been defined for them to come and hit on our SNS servers and each aggregator has a different URL, right, so that we can keep them separate and we make sure that, again, we split that way. Any other questions? So we're actually in EU because when we started this, Singapore wasn't available here. So it's five years ago. And what's the reason for combining the Android and web server to the third line? Because Android was basically consuming a web API, mm -hmm. right? And what we realized was there was no good reason to have that code base be separate. Because every time that we made a modification to the API of Android, we also had to make the same modification to the API of the web. So we ended up combining the APIs 
and we unified the Android and the web application. So the web application now is like a full HTML5 uh, socket based thing and we're using Node.js for publishing data, uh, we're using uh, Redis to push notifications out to it. So you can do stuff like you can start a top up and then do another top up and do another top up and do another top up and they all start queuing up on the site and then the socket sends back data, which is data back once this entire process is finished. Right, so once the queue gets processed, once the data comes back, one more publication occurs and that publication pushes it to the socket that was corresponding to that request. That's, that's a whole different topic. Right? <laughs> that took us a while. Anything else? Uh, how many servers do you use in your If you have some questions, then you uh, please ask them to mind. Sorry. This is live streaming, so uh, you know, people will be able to hear your questions as well. Um, so, right now the server number specifically of reserved instances is about 30, but depending upon the scale level, obviously the numbers go up and down. So I actually don't know how many servers are running right now, because depending upon the workload it might be more, it might be less. Right? Uh, one more question, like, uh, are you using the CDN for that? Using service of CDN providers? Yes, we're using we're using Amazon for that as well. Amazon? Yeah, okay. we're using cloud. Actually, actually we, um, where I work, uh, we have a sign that is uh, the stars that is moving and like, to then move and move say. Okay. Okay. So, uh, what happened? Like, if I'm trying to play, there is a video. Uh, okay. If I try, uh, try to play any content, it's very very slow. Very slow. Okay. So, what I'm thinking, like, they, uh, when I want to play the video, we are using the Legacy and line sure. So, uh, so uh, what I think I can put any like, uh, CDN, CDN place, uh, uh, or somebody in India, I think so, because of that, it's not casing from that. Right. That side. You're probably pulling from somewhere. So, how do you feel in India? What, what CDN provider is good? So, we've only used Amazon, and Amazon has two edge locations in India. I believe one is in Delhi and the other might be in Chennai or in Bangalore, I'm not sure. I think it's Chennai, yeah. yeah. So there are two edge locations in India. Uh, nothing for Western Maharashtra, you know, Western India unfortunately yet. But it's pretty fast. I mean, we haven't really faced a problem in terms of speed. Uh, we tend to be a lot quicker in terms of page loads now because we're using the CDN exclusively for even solving the web application. So what we did was we built a static HTML application with JavaScript files mm -hmm. and all the, uh, the dynamic content is being pulled over JavaScript. Mm -hmm. So we don't, our web application is no longer being served from a web server at all. It's just a web app that gets delivered over HTML and then JavaScript's doing all the rest of the work. Thank you. Okay, so just a few numbers. These are the number of transactions that we do per month. Uh, on a good day, we do about 500 transactions a second at peak load. Um, and that's being managed with the server capacity that, we have, that I spoke about, about $6,000 uh, worth of hardware. And we have about 30% headroom. So we leave our servers running at about 70, 60 to 70% capacity to deal with that eventual spike that might occur. And auto scale only triggers when it passes that 66% threshold. So basically, we keep 33% headroom on the servers before triggering our auto scale spikes. Right? Um, yeah, so you know, some other numbers are very interesting. To a large extent, we don't have downtime at all um, because we've, we've kind of built it so that all these different parts, we might have like um, sort of downtime for one service because the vendor is not responding, like you know, Dish TV decided to do a reboot of their server and suddenly you can't get Dish TV to go through. But that's outside our control. Um, we try to deal with that gracefully at the client level. But by and large, our servers don't go down. That's good. Um, and you know, to a large extent, that's going to hopefully stay the case. We are making a whole bunch of changes in terms of we're starting to add more and more uh, Node.js code because we find that Node.js is really, really flexible in terms of being able to keep lots and lots of concurrent connections open without eating up and destroying your CPU. So we're moving some of the services, specifically the stuff that's talking to vendors, to Node.js. Um, beyond that, uh, some of the stuff that we're trying to do is we're trying to use uh, MapReduce, so some Hadoop stuff. 
to be able to mine all this data that we're collecting. So that's that's on our roadmap. Sure. Uh, you, you explain all the things very well. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, I, I'm just curious about one thing. What testing strategy do you have used for this? I mean, this is very big infrastructure. Yes. And the migration from one thing to another really that was under your decision. And again, Android application and uh, your API, you basically uh, combine them. Yeah. And yeah. another related to your code, the like application infrastructure. How do you manage your testing strategy? So, for us, testing was a case of two different very important things. One was the actual testing to make sure the application didn't fail. But a second more important thing was performance, which was a lot harder for us to gauge at testing them. Because a change, like I said, when a change occurred in one particular place, they added a new piece of code to the dashboard, and suddenly our performance level went up or rather went down by 20%. Um, st stuff still gets through the gate. Right? Stuff that should not have ever been in production that ends up in production. Because we have a very um, disparate system in terms of the the load, 90% of the load is actually not from our system, it's coming from an external person. Right? It's coming from how long it takes for a particular vendor to respond. So it's very difficult for us to kind of load test to the extent that we have to. I can't foresee where the failure will occur. So what we've done is we've split it up into pieces so that when a failure occurs, it's isolated only to that part. Right? So that was the major learning that we do. Um, as far as testing is concerned, obviously we have automated testing, we have testing that's baked into each of the modules that we're building and then you've got three people whose job it is to break the application. Right? So they're testing on all the various platforms and that's just the manual, like you know, every time the feature has to go out, it goes through the usual checklists and things. Our deployment strategy is everything has to be up on the staging server and fully tested and certified by everybody prior to moving it to the production server. And the, 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 the act of moving it from staging to production is completely automated. Right? So we basically flip a switch, we say okay, this is the version number from Git that needs to be pushed onto the production servers, we initiate rolling restarts if required. And that's all scripted. That's all like you know done using uh, shell scripting and uh, AWS. So AWS lets us control the instances themselves through the command line, right? So I can drop an instance from the load balancer and I can add it back from the command line. So I can build it into my script that drop the instance, restart it. When it boots up, it sends a ping back. Okay, now add it back to the load balancer. Start the restart on the next one. So there's a script that basically like deals with that rolling restart all the way across. Yes, so we have our own custom monitoring tool that we've built, uh, plus we use that on top of CloudWatch metrics, which is something that Amazon themselves provide us with. Amazon's metrics give us data at the VM level. They are not technically allowed to look higher than that. So they can't see what's happening inside my application, they can't see what's happening uh, inside my RAM. So in order for us to actually figure out what was happening for our application, we ended up building a suite of, tech of tools ourselves. And that's something that we are considering packaging as a product because it's gotten to the point where it's pretty advanced as well. So let's see. Maybe I'll be back here next year showing you the product. All right. Anything else? I think that's it. Yeah. That's it. That's all I got. Sure. Sorry, what was that? How much of your resources do you resource plan as far as you do understanding how many things you have? Well, it's kind of hard to say at this point because, like I said, we, we run two companies, right? One's the software development company and one's our cloud management company, cloud infrastructure company. Uh, EPRS and BySmart, that the company that owns BySmart is called EPRS. Um, were our first customers as cloud cover, right? And uh, a lot of the systems and things that we developed were around this installation. So today, I would say that 90% of it is automated. There's a guy, one guy, that has a dashboard open that sees you know what's happening on the servers. In the event of something horribly going wrong, obviously it's all hands on deck. But uh, routinely, like you know, day to day. 
Uh, very little of our resource, maybe 5% goes towards just the, the upkeep and maintenance of the system. But it's got to that point after many years, right? I mean, it's not something that we woke up in the morning and it was that easy. It's got to that point because we, we had to do all that stuff to get there. Sure. Uh, so we used all the same stuff. Yeah, we used Redis for publication and we used Node.js for the application itself. We used HTML, CSS, JavaScript bundle for the client. Dashboards using D3 graphs, you know, that kind of stuff. Yeah. Are you not using any? Are you not using any uh, application? We're using Chef. So we, we tried Puppet, we tried Chef. Uh, we settled on Chef uh, after a raging internal debate. Uh, I'm still partial to Puppet actually, but I lost that fight. So, so far. <laughs> we also used a couple of the tools. We tried out the stuff that Amazon provides as well. They have a couple of uh, DevOps management tools that they have. So we tried those as well. At the end of the day, we felt like we needed more customization. We needed to be able to do more stuff. So we ended up going with our own. This is actually an instance running that just takes care of the chef deployments. Okay? Anything else? Thank you very much, guys. Thanks.